Um, my name is James Pepper. I'm the chair of the Vermont Cannabis Control Board. Today is Wednesday, December 14th. It's one o'clock and I call this meeting to order. The very sad news, Will Rapp passed away this week. Um, he was a true pioneer in cooperative agriculture and a giant in Vermont's agricultural economy for the past four decades. No one um, has had more of an influence on the way that I approach cannabis regulation than Will. I first met him in 2015 in the governor's office when he was pitching then Governor Shumlin on legalizing cannabis. We had just received the RAND report um, that showed what demand for cannabis might look like in Vermont if we were the only state on the East Coast with legal adult, a legal adult use program. And um, none of the kind of policy wants knew quite how best to approach the problem of supplying the entire East Coast or at least New England with cannabis. Other than we needed big indoor grow operations and we needed them quickly. Will very shrewdly um, knew then what seems obvious now that unless we do something special here and build Vermont values into the very DNA of our cannabis industry, we not only risk doing irreparable harm to the Vermont brand, we also would not have a sustainable market once other East Coast states came online. He told us to keep the plot small, um, to embrace craft cultivation, to encourage the formation of cooperatives, to force larger operators to use sustainable growing practices and pay their employees a livable wage, to create rigorous testing standards, and to lead the way on genetics and research. These are the very principles that we're trying to place at the core of our mission at the CCB. We're not there yet, and uh, just like a good garden, our laws and our rules and our regulations need constant tending, but this is the vision, and I just thank Will for articulating it so eloquently for me back in 2015, for living his values and all of his endeavors, and for the ongoing legacy of the Intervale and the employee-owned Gardener Supply. Um, you will be missed. All right. Um, so in other news, um, our product registration process, our new process, is going to go live later this week. Um, we're finally leaving the stone age of Microsoft Forms and incorporating product registration into our licensing portal. So now when you log into your CCB account, there will be a tab that will allow you to register products. If you've already submitted a product registration through the Microsoft Form, you do not need to resubmit um, through this new process. You do not need to resubmit. Um, we're going to be doing another Q&A session on product registration. I think the date is Tuesday, December 27th at 6 p.m. Um, just a reminder that in the new year, we will be shifting around our meeting schedule a bit. Um, at our next meeting, we'll approve our regular meeting schedule for the new year. Uh, but the gist is that we're going to be moving to one board meeting per month. In between board meetings, we'll be reviving our subject matter specific networking events. <clears throat> We've been brainstorming some topics that seem to need some attention, things like insurance requirements, tax compliance, cultivation best practices, licensing renewal. Um, but please email the board or tell us during public comment about other topics that might be helpful. On a somewhat related note, um, these events are part of our education first approach to compliance with a system that's understandably new to everyone. We know that we didn't contemplate every scenario in our rules and that there are ambiguities or gaps in the rules that we created. We actively are trying to close those gaps with guidance documents. We always anticipated that there'd be, there would need to be a fair amount of handholding at the outset of this market to make sure people are in compliance with our rules, but we're very quickly getting to a point where we can no longer chalk up some of the issues that we're seeing to good faith mistakes. Everyone with a cannabis license should have an intimate familiarity with our rules, our guidance, 
and the FAQ section of our website. We should not be fielding questions like, can I buy cannabis from an unlicensed cultivator? There is no excuse for not collecting taxes properly or fudging the number of employees you have in order to avoid fire safety jurisdiction. It's the fundamental responsibility of any business owner to know the rules of the market that they're participating in. And the CCB at its core is an enforcement agency. We drafted our rules with a tremendous amount of public input and we're committed to listening to the industry and amending them as needed but we're not gonna turn a blind eye to violations that result from either intentional ignorance or bad faith. And again, we know we didn't think of everything. So if there is confusion or ambiguity, please let us know. We will draft guidance. We will continue to hold Q&A sessions. We will continue to host these networking events um, to help kind of guide this industry. We have um, quite a bit to get through today. So why don't we, the minutes from our last meeting. Um, I don't think Nellie did a sufficient job kind of talking about the emotional impact that, you know, David's leaving, uh, <laughs> you know, had on me in the minutes, but uh, I think that they're an accurate reflection of the meeting. I mean, I can, I can always amend them if you, if uh, the board <laughs> feels strongly. No, it's all right. <laughs> Is there a motion? So moved. Seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 <laughs> Okay, um, we have a concentrates report um, that's due to the legislature, and um, we're, it's currently out to comment for our with our advisory committee. Um, but we figured we'd walk through it today, and it might change a little bit, but um, might as well just kind of get it get it on the record. Yep. <clears throat> One more try here. At least we think something happened. So. Yep. It's not my job as a guy. <laughs> Yeah. It sounds like what if you opened it, open Teams, and just shared it from your computer? I might need to give you a presentation. for the technical okay. difficulties, folks. Attention is building for this report. I know. <laughs> it really is. <laughs> <clears throat> I can have my AV card duties stripped. <laughs> <laughs>
Ellie, does Bryn have a uh, presenter status? Uh -oh. She does, but she's not in the meeting, I don't think. Oh, uh. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> okay. Also, not, not working. Brand, if you email me the um the report, I can bring it up on the screen. Okay. Let's try that. I think it was actually here. Try now. I heard it click. Hello. 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 Oh. Oh. <laughs> Thanks, Trevor. Excellent. Thank you. I guess it was my fault. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We did it. dropped that thing a couple times this morning. I know. <laughs> All right, well, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> moved around quite a bit. Thanks everybody for your patience. Okay, so um, as the chair mentioned, this is our uh, draft report to the legislature um, with respect to the solid concentrates, um, the cap on solid concentrates. Um, and it's an 82 page report. Uh, I'm not gonna go through every single page um, in detail, um, but I will. I will review it for the board. Um, this is a draft, as the chair mentioned, um, it's gone out to our advisory committee and we're waiting for comment from them um, and we will submit it to the legislature at the end of the month. So we will get this draft posted to the website and indicate clearly that it's a draft and we will also, um, once we have finalized it and sent it to the legislature, we will replace it with the final version. So we've got an overview here. I'm just gonna skip through the first few slides. Um, these are the requirements of the report. So the legislation uh, specifically asked the board to um, provide a summary of the regulated market share for solid concentrates above 60% THC and the status of the illicit market for these products um, in other states that have a regulated adult use cannabis market. So. Um, here is the section of legislation that puts um, that imposes a cap on um, cannabis flower and solid concentrate products. So um, prohibited products in the state of Vermont include cannabis flower with greater than 30% THC um, and solid concentrates with greater than 60% THC. So um, this is kind of a specific portion of the legislation that we're dealing with. So we jump into the key findings portion of the report, um, and this slide provides um, some high-level takeaways from a summary of the research, which comes a little bit later in the in the report. But um, high-level is that few states impose percentage-based THC limits. Um, specifically, it's only two: um, Vermont and Connecticut impose a THC limit on solid concentrate products. Um, there's really a dearth of research for regulators to rely upon um, because of federal prohibition. And there's really no uh, scientific consensus that has emerged on the potential um, mental health effects of using these types of high potency solid concentrate products. Um, the report also um, summarizes the work that Massachusetts and Colorado have done um, on looking into this issue. Both of those states have done a pretty deep dive into um, the solid concentrates issue, and both have concluded that there's um, insufficient 
research and sufficient literature on the use of these products um, such that regulators can really draw a conclusion um, on the best course of action. Um, so I'll, I'll just continue with these kind of top takeaways because this offers a good synopsis of what's to come. Um, these creating low potency solid concentrate products um, are would essentially what, what producers would have to do to create low potency solid concentrate products um, is to incorporate some sort of additive or excipient into the product, um, which could conceivably have a negative health impact. Um, and that can be seen with the E-Valley crisis. Um, consumer education is really critical to ensuring that um, users of these products are using safe or using doses. Safe, 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 safe. And um, later in the report, uh, we go into how, um, how, the, uh, the, how the number of how users how are, how estimated users are in Vermont. Um, and the takeaway is that solid concentrates really make up a, a pretty small um, portion of the existing illicit market, um, and the estimate is somewhere between four and eight percent of um, cannabis consumers use solid concentrate products. And finally, a prohibition on um, these solid concentrates with um, greater than 60% concentration of THC is really likely to keep these types of products in the illicit market as opposed to having a, a regulated market for them. So the main recommendation, main takeaway from the report um, is that the board is recommending that the legislature remove um, the concentration limit for solid concentrate products and authorize a consumer education and use prevention campaign. Um, the recommendation is that a portion of the revenue that is uh, directed to the Department of Health um, from the excise taxes from cannabis products uh, be used to fund these education programs. And lastly, um, a recommendation that the board make this information available, including safe dos dosage information um, and other public health information relevant to these types of products. So the next portion of the report is um, uh, some educational materials um, from the legislature about what these types of products are and how they're made. Um, so I will kind of review these pretty quickly. This is um, just a description of what, what are solid concentrated products and how are they used um, and how are they made. Um, I'm just going to skip through some of these uh, about the common production uh, techniques for making these types of products. Um, this slide talks about how to produce a low potency concentrate. There have been um, some suggestions to the legislature that uh, that uh, manufacturers could create low potency um, THC products or solid concentrate products, and um, and this slide kind of describes that all, the way that these products are manufactured um, really necessarily creates um, a product with a high concentration of THC really at the outset. Um, and as such, really the only way to lower that um, concentration level of THC would be to uh, dilute the product or add an excipient or some kind of, that, kind of additive um, that would dilute the concentration after the extraction process is already complete. Um, so a uh, good example of this is um, adding oil and vape cartridges. Um, and for solid concentrates, really the only reason to add any kind of filler um, to that product is uh, to meet the potency threshold that is provided for in statute. Um, so a little bit more discussion about the types of fillers that would be used. Um, there's really no, the board really doesn't have a way of knowing what manufacturers would use for filler product um, if they were required to add filler to their products to meet that concentration limit. Um, and the board is not really in a great position to evaluate the safety of these types of additives. So the next couple of slides are, um, address the danger of using filler to dilute concentrates. Um, so we've got some information here about how 
Um, adding filler really disrupts the natural composition of a cannabis product, um, and using fillers and excipients could lead to unintended negative health consequences. Um, and we reference the E-Valley crisis um, as a good example of the dangers that can arise when you're using filler um, for products that are inhaled. And there's more additional information about the E-Valley crisis later in the, in the report. Uh, but the conclusion really here is that consumers are likely in a better position if they consume a full spectrum product um, that reflects the natural composition of the plant um, in its natural state. Um, so the next set of slides uh, are about how some other states are handling um, their high concentration products. So as we mentioned in the beginning, only um, it's really only Vermont and Connecticut are, are imposing these potency limits on concentrates. Um, data in the illicit market is difficult to come by. Um, and when we're looking at uh, the, the number of consumers in other states of, of concentrated products, um, sometimes it's difficult to have a, have a really um, good understanding of who's using the solid concentrate products, like what percentage of users are using solid concentrate products versus other types of concentrates, because most states don't break down um, their sales data between liquid concentrates and solid concentrates. So this is the um, this is a map of the states that have uh, legalized adult use, and you can see that the two states in purple, Vermont and Connecticut, are the only states that have Im imposed a concentration limit on um, concentrate products. Montana has imposed um, a potency limit on flour only, but um, we are the only two states that impose uh, that concentration limit on solid concentrates and flour. So here's a chart of the other states and you can see Connecticut um, flour percentage limit and concentrate percentage limit is the same as Vermont. Um, our concentrate limit is for solid concentrates only. So um, this slide um, discusses how most other states um, really don't take the approach of limiting the concentration of THC, but instead adopt the per milligram of THC limits on edibles. Um, and that's the way that most states handle this. So only Vermont and Connecticut. Other states are uh, taking some other approaches to encourage responsible um, cannabis consumption. And there will be some more information about this later in the report about states that are taking a consumer education approach. Um, and this final bullet indicates that, you know, there have been lessons learned. Um, there have been lessons learned about the uh, ineffectiveness of prohibition. Um, and the and this can kind of be extrapolated to the limitation on the types of products that you can purchase from the regulated market. Prohibiting certain types of products isn't going to prevent consumers from finding those products either on the illicit market um, or online or in other states. And um, having, having consumers use these unregulated tested products from the illicit market um, pose pretty significant uh, health risks to them. So this is a chart on the state potency limits for edibles. Um, the majority of states have the 10 milligram THC limit per serving and the 100 milligram limit per package. Um, Vermont is a minority of states that have the lower THC limits per serving and per package at five milligrams per serving and 50 per package. Um, and then we have a couple of slides that detail how Canada handles this issue. Um, so there are no percentage-based potency limits at the federal level in Canada. Um, there is an exception for Quebec, um, which we discuss on the following slide. So Canada abides by that 10 milligram um, per package limit uh, for THC, and the, their concentrates per package are um, limited to 1,000 milligrams. 
So Quebec is the exception. Um, they essentially ban um, concentrated products because they've got a 30% concentration limit on those products, which amounts to an effective ban. Um, there is some data on solid concentrate usage in Quebec, which shows that about 9% of cannabis users there report using solid concentrates. Um, so this, this does indicate that because there's an effective ban on these products in the regulated market, what Quebec has done is essentially push consumers to um, the illicit market for, for using these types of products. Um, so the next set of slides discusses state efforts to regulate these products um, and it includes Colorado's um, consumer handout that they've recently developed that um, gets handed out to, to consumers who are buying these types of high concentrate products. So um, we've got some information about some legislation that passed um, in California and Colorado. Um, California, or Colorado was mandated to come up with a four-page educational handout and um, provide that handout to everybody who is purchasing a concentrate in their retail market. And this is um, what that handout looks like. So it has um, quite a bit of information in this four-pager, including the um, appropriate concentrate serving size, which is down on the bottom on the left, which is that little dot. Um, is the recommended serving size for concentrates. Also includes information about the risks and precautions um, for using these types of products, how uh, concentrated THC products um, have a different effect on the body than other types of, um, other types of cannabis products. And also provides information about the labeling requirements the penalties imposed um, for violating the Colorado um, statute and some additional resources, including the poison control hotline, um, suicide prevention hotline, some other crisis hotlines that are available to consumers in Colorado, um, and then some links to public health resources. So this is um, the handout that Colorado was mandated to come up with and hand out to anybody who's purchasing these concentrated products in Colorado. So then the next several slides deal with um, cannabis equivalency uh, numbers in other regulated states. Um, Colorado is the, um, is the one that Vermont is following for equivalencies. Uh, these are some excerpts from the marijuana equivalency and portion and dosage report that um, the Colorado Department of Revenue developed in 2015. Several slides on these equivalency numbers. And here's a slide on the um, alcohol product equivalency. And I think that this, people are generally pretty familiar with the alcohol product equivalency chart. Um, and Colorado did start out in their work to develop their consumer handout um, with the goal of coming up with something similar to this, but um, given the kind of scope of, of different types of cannabis products, they found that difficult. Instead, wound up with the handout that we just reviewed. So the next um, batch of slides is about um, the research that has been done on cannabis potency, different cannabis potency products. Um, and general takeaways from the literature covering um, the use of these types of products. Essentially, the takeaway is that um, there is really insufficient data to make any um, really informed decisions about prohibiting these products. So we've got limitations on the data. Um, the Massachusetts Cannabis Control Commission did a report um, or did a survey of all of the existing data um, to come up with some conclusions. And here are some highlights of, from that report that indicate the barriers to um, doing adequate research on this really leave regulators in the position of not having much to go on. Um, so Annabeth, uh, Massachusetts and Colorado both um, 
uh, legislatively mandated report to evaluate the existing research um, to determine whether or not they should impose potency restrictions in those states. Um, both states determined that, that there was just insufficient research um, on the use of these products to be able to draw any reliable conclusions. So here is a summary uh, or some takeaways from the Massachusetts report. Conclusion from that report was the evidence was insufficient to recommend a potency cap and that there was more work that was needed to understand the potential unintended consequences of imposing a limit, um, including how other components of the cannabis plant work to enhance or reduce the effects of THC. And there's a link to the report there. So the Colorado report um, completed in 2021, the key takeaway there um, was that once again, the federal prohibition um, results in really inadequate research uh, to determine whether or not these high concentrate products um, and the use of these products is safe. So there was not a full conclusion here either. And um, Colorado is working on a follow-up report, which should be out by the end of this year. So we've got some more um, research summaries here. I'm not going to go through all of these. Here's the slide on the general takeaways um, on the summary of all of the existing research. And that really boils down to a significant need for additional research into the effects of high potency cannabis products. Um, and that really public policy should evolve as the scientific research develops. There is um, some studies that have found a correlation between high potency cannabis product use and increased risk of negative health effects, especially in young people. Um, the studies have shown that this correlation could be the result of individuals having underlying mental health issues um, and those individuals being more likely to use high potency products. But high potency products have not been causally linked to the genesis of significant health problems but it's possible that they exacerbate or trigger a pre-existing mental health problem. Um, so this slide kind of articulates the concern um, of the board when it comes to prohibiting these types of products. Um, prohibiting high, con high, high concentrate THC products in the legal market isn't going to eliminate the demand for them. Um, people will turn to the unregulated illicit market or purchase these products in other states or potentially create their own um, by using extraction processes in their home, which can also be dangerous. Um, using excipients, um, additives um, to create a low potency version of these products um, could potentially have other health effects, unintended health consequences, um, and also the types of, um, the, the way that these products are manufactured um, can often result in residual solvents existing in these products. So I, uh, the idea is really that these um, high concentrate products are especially prone to having contaminants um, or other types of impurities. So forcing um, users of these products to the unregulated illicit market could also create uh, pretty significant health impacts that would outweigh the benefit um, that could result from prohibiting them. And lastly, the Massachusetts experience with Evali um, really illustrates the potential dangers of removing these types of products from the regulated market and forcing users of them to purchase on the illicit market instead. So the next couple of slides are the Massachusetts, detail the Massachusetts experience with the Evali crisis. 
Um, I think that the board is really pretty familiar with this by now. We've um, done quite a bit of discussion of the Evali crisis. I won't do that. Um, so the estimate of the market. So these next several slides attempt to get our arms around um, the number of cannabis users that would be um, interested in using these types of products from the regulated market. Um, it's difficult for us to assess what the illicit market really looks like, difficult for us to get um, data from the illicit market. However, we did, the report does look to um, the data from our medical market to see how, um, how many of our medical patients are using these types of products. Um, also looking at sales data from other states um, and looking at some survey data to try and understand um, what the market for these products looks like. Um, so this is just kind of a general disclaimer slide about how this kind of data is difficult to gather. Um, other states don't always separate um, their concentrated products into solid concentrate and uh, liquid concentrated products. So it's difficult to get um, a really accurate representation of what's going on in every state. So this is a summary of some data from the Vermont cannabis market. Um, so 2019 survey found that 2% of adults and 8% of high school students indicated that dabbing was their primary consumption method. Um, and a year later, a survey found that 4% of adult consumers in Vermont, adult cannabis consumers, indicated that um, they dabbed or used cannabis in some other way. So um, I think the later slides talk about the Vermont medical market. But the prediction based on these surveys, this data is that um, around 4%, 4 to 8% um, of the market would be for these solid concentrate products. So we've got um, data here that um, this is more information about our estimates on the size of the market, um, which we're estimated to be around 318 million. So this slide indicates, so this is kind of anecdotal information about how pretty easy it is to find, um, find these products on the illicit market uh, for sale online. And also to point out that, you know, consumers near the border um, are likely to be driving over the border to Massachusetts to, pur to purchase these types of products. And also an emphasis on, um, you know, members of, People who are operating on the illicit market and also consumers could be producing these products in their home or in other um, areas that are not regulated by the board. So that could be um, a potential public health hazard. So here's a chart about medical sales by product type. Um, you can see that the percent of the medical market for concentrates is around 4%. Um, here is that translated into Numbers, prediction of the numbers over the next four years. So here is just a summary of where we are anticipating um, the Vermont market to be when it comes to the solid concentrate products. So here we um, go into some data from other states that shows a approximately what portion of the market in those other states it goes to the solid concentrate product. Um, so it looks like about 23.2% of retail sales in Maine um, from last year were for concentrate products, but this um, is likely a much larger number because they do not separate out their solid concentrate products from, from the liquid product, liquid concentrate products. There's a chart of those main numbers. So concentrate um, sales amount of the concentrates is in blue on the on the right side as compared to other types of cannabis products. Again, this is not does not break out solid concentrates from liquid. So not a not a perfect comparison. Um, 
Massachusetts does break down their sales information between solid um, and liquid concentrates. So um, the number here uh, is, so year to date sales um, for concentrated products accounts for about almost 6% of their retail sales. And that is for solid concentrates. So here's a chart from Massachusetts. Um, a little bit tricky to read this chart. A lot of information here. So Michigan is another um, state that allows for these products. They also don't separate out um, their solid concentrate from their liquid concentrate, but it's the yellow um, inhalable compound concentrate is the portion of their market that's taken up by those types of products. So here you can see their concent the portion of their market that's taken up with concentrates, about 7.6% in June of 2020, um, and it's dropped to about 6.17% two years later. Oregon data, same here. Um, they're concentrated in extracts. They don't separate them out, but... Um, they accounted for about 23% of the market uh, five years ago. And today, it's roughly the same, about 24%. So you can see a little rise in June of 2018, but essentially leveled off um, in 2020. And it's been the same for the last three years, two years. Um, so Colorado surveys are on the next couple of slides and they show um, the prevalence of different consumption methods over time. So you can see um, dabbing accounted for about 17.7% um, of the types of use in 2015. Um, and that did increase to 23.5% in 2018, um, but has since dropped, leveled off a bit since 2019. So it's currently um, almost 21% of the methods of use among consumers in, in Colorado. And you can see at the bottom of the page indicates um, students who are, uh, so young people who are using cannabis. Um, that comes from the Healthy Kids Colorado survey data that does show an increase uh, over time from 2015 starting at 28% and in 2021 going up to 49%. So um, the next set of the kind of we'll wrap up the report with our recommendations um, and that we go back to that initial slide that talks about our four-part four, four part plan um, to promote public safety regarding concentrates. So the first is to remove the potency cap for solid concentrates, um, to authorize consumer education campaigns and youth prevention programs um, by using a portion of the revenue allocated to the Department of Health for substance misuse prevention programs, um, and also to make public health information, including safe dosage information, readily available to the public. So we've got guiding principles here um, that education really works better than prohibition. Prohibition isn't going to eliminate the demand or the supply of these types of high potency products and um, could actually be counterproductive when it comes to promoting public safety because these products are readily available in the illicit market. Um, and prohibiting them is going to drive production and sales into the underground market where there will undoubtedly be additional safety risks both for the public and for um, the people who are using these products. And we've got um, a reminder here to ourselves that um, we have a specific mandate from the General Assembly to move as much of the illicit market as possible into the regulated market in order to protect consumer um, safety and public safety. Um, 
And because the current scientific evidence really does not justify a prohibition, um, it's the recommendation of the board to remove, um, remove that prohibition. So further information about um, the rationale behind this recommendation. Um, this is sort of a reminder to the legislature that they um, recognize that prohibition of cannabis was really a failed policy and they chose to replace it with a system that allows consumers access to regulated and tested products that comes with education um, about their safety. And that should really be extended to the high potency solid concentrate products. Since um, there are a percentage of uh, Vermonters who are using them and might be unaware of their risks. So this is a proposal to um, launch two different types of educational campaigns um, in along with removing that um, potency cap. And the first is the consumer education program for adults, um, which should focus on safe consumption methods um, and general information about how these products differ from other types of cannabis products. And separately, um, youth prevention efforts, which should focus on reducing, reducing um, access for youth um, to these types of products. And this is a reminder to the legislature that the Department of Health is entitled to up to 30% of the cannabis excise tax revenue to fund substance misuse prevention programs. Um, and this would be an appropriate use of that funding. And then the last couple of slides are on how to make this public health information readily available to the public. So the recommendation is um, to develop educational materials around high potency cannabis products so that um, users of those products really understand what they are, how their effects differ from that of other cannabis products and what, what um, safe consumption really looks like. So um, it's the recommendation that we provide this information on our website, um, that all retail establishments have this information available for customers um, and that every solid concentrate product include a QR code um, that gives the consumer access to this public information, public health information um, quickly and easily. Um, and this kind of describes the recommendation to not mandate um, a handout with uh, a solid concentrate product. Um, so though um, there is an, a quite a bit of information that the board could provide. Um, it's not necessarily a recommendation that um, everything, all of that information be included on the label because that can really reduce the readability and understandability of that information. Um, so it's the recommendation that the label include a QR code so that consumers can access it um, and to make sure the retailers have the information available to consumers if they want it, um, but also to more specifically provide um, just that safe dosage uh, amount on the label. And then some final other recommendations, which is to really advocate for additional research, um, especially on high potency products um, so that states and regulators are better able to um, regulate these types of products. Um, and also to clarify to the legislature that cannabis products aren't subject to the tobacco product. Um, because cannabis and tobacco are really two separate and distinct types of product, um, the taxation on them should reflect the different challenges that the state faces in regulating those products. And there we have it. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. Thank you. So, um, you know, the the reason we have to submit this report um, is because the legislature could not resolve this issue uh, during the session earlier this year. They wanted some kind of more concrete uh, information. And um, our recommendation has not changed. You know, we do believe that uh, there will be a net benefit to consumer safety and public safety to have a regulated product as opposed to an unregulated product. Um, <clears throat> we'll see uh, how it goes. We 
you know, just to be clear, we don't have the authority to eliminate this cap on our own. This is a statutory prohibition. Um, and um, we'll, it's going to require legislative action to get rid of it. Um, so we'll see how it goes. Any uh, comments on the report before we move on? Yeah. Nope. All right. <clears throat> And why don't we move on to the staff recommendations for licensure? Okay. Oh. <laughs> All right, so here is um, the adult use and medical register for this week. Um, starting out with our medical numbers. Um, we've our number of new applications and renewal applications dropped a bit this week, um, but staff did issue 42 patient cards. Um, and we are well within our, our 30 days. Staff are processing applications received on or after November 18th is it this week. So moving on to the adult use license application, here are the numbers from this week. There. Um, so we've got 30 new, 34 uh, new applications in the door this week. Um, as usual, the majority of them are for employee ID cards. Um, we've got about 25 new employee ID card applications. Um, four new retail applications. Two new manufacturing um, applications for both a tier one and a tier two. One new wholesale application and two new cultivator applications, one for a tier two mixed and one for a tier one indoor. So moving on to, this is our chart describing um, the location within the state of all retail, um, all retail applications, both in the queue and also um, retailers that have been issued their license. So we now have 57 up four from last week. Um, the, the new four applicants um, are in, one is in Burlington, one is in Rutland, one is in Bennington, and one is in Plymouth. So that um, brings our total in the Burlington area up to nine. So that includes retailers that have been issued their license and those that are still in the process of applying. I think of note that there's you know, nine applications in Burlington, one in Winooski and one in Essex, but none in Williston, none in Colchester. I mean, the rest of Chittenden County doesn't really have other retail establishments. I was thinking about this this morning in terms of um, concentration and volume of retailers. You know, in a, an age where most retail is not brick and mortar, I think m more brick and mortar is gonna be required in our most populated county in order for people to access products. So just thinking about that this morning. I'll move on to staff recommendations for their for a license. So this is your list of applicants that have demonstrated compliance with all of the requirements for a license, both in board rule and statute. Um, we've got Rainbow's End Cannabis applying for an indoor tier two cultivation license. Kingdom Boys, applying for a tier one indoor cultivation license. Verbio, applying for a retail license. Dalen LTD, applying for a retail license. Superkind Farms, applying for um, an outdoor tier one cultivation license. Stone Leaf Cannabis, applying for a retail license. Vermont Craft Edibles, applying for a Tier 2 manufacturing license. Integrity Farms, applying for an indoor Tier 1 cultivation license. And Fat Cat Farm, applying for a Tier 1 mixed cultivation license. This is your group for this week. Um, our license amendment chart here indicates that we have one new um, license amendment in the queue. Um, and then we have our social equity numbers here, which indicate that we have four 
new applicants um, that are claiming social equity status. And then lastly, we have um, one recommendation for social equity status approval, and that's for submission number 1715. Um, and staff is recommending social equity status approval for this applicant because they meet the criteria for social equity business applicant as defined in board rules. Um, one recommendation for denial of social equity status, and that's for submission number um, 781. So this applicant does not meet the criteria for a social equity business applicant as defined in board rule. And then lastly, um, the, the staff is recommending um, issuance of an employee ID card um, for an applicant who has met the criteria for overcoming presumptive disqualification as set out in board rule. That's your list for this week. And on that last one, the overcoming presumptive disqualification, generally speaking, we go into executive session to discuss the specifics of the case. The staff did present us a memo. Um, and uh, after reading the memo, you know, Bryn talked to all of us and none of us decided we needed to have any further discussion. So we will not be doing an executive session to talk about that. So any questions for Bryn? Nope. All right. Is there a uh, motion to approve the staff recommendations? I move that the board accept each of the recommendations as presented to us by staff in this meeting. I second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Great. Um, so why don't we move to public comment? Um, same as always, uh, please, if you join by the link, raise your virtual hand if you'd like to comment. Um, We'll call on you in the order that you raise your hand, and uh, then we'll move to people that join by the phone. Nellie, if you could help us with the order. Absolutely. Uh, we have Dolan Dolan first, which I think is Jesse Lynn. Hello. Yes, this is Jesse Lynn. Thank you guys, as always, for taking public comment. Um, a few things I want to quickly, so I'll be as quick as I can, comment on is your report now in the hands of the advisory committee. I'm hoping that there is some kind of consideration for the seat on the advisory committee that is meant to be a patient representative for the symptom relief oversight committee. My understanding is as of right now, that seat remains empty. So just mentioning that we are missing a big, um, you know, member of the advisory board that would be representing patients and patients thoughts. So if that can just be, you know, known and and see what we can do about that. I also wanted to throw out there that with the new federal regulations changing on research, and you guys have mentioned multiple times how beneficial research would be, and I think we all know that, if you guys could consider in 2023 looking at a specific licensing structure for research, which would include on-site consumption. A great example is right now I just uh, launched my own research study, which is specifically working to help people who feel they have overconsumed cannabis. So I think this would be a consumer safety support mechanism. And if we had an on-site consumption site, I could get my research done in about two days instead of probably three to four months. So if Vermont could consider, as Massachusetts has put a research license in place, allowing on-site consumption, I think that would be fabulous moving forward. Um, I also quickly wanted to mention that, as you guys know, I'm always a big proponent for education and appreciate that you are as well. Working with the Vermont Department of Health, I would ask that you guys consider including, again, not only patient voices, but also to work with the Department of Health, some industry, uh, cannabis industry professionals to bring in their insight and experience. When Working with the Vermont Department of Health, we know we have some great educated medical professionals, but we do not necessarily have medical professionals who are educated specifically in cannabis, and I think that is something we are missing. An example of that is the, recent, um, the pamphlet that retailers need to have available for consumers that the Department of Health put together with you guys. There is one or two things in there that I think do need to look at being updated that was missed. We talk about vaping in that pamphlet and it does not in any way differentiate vaping flour versus vaping concentrates. So I think that's an example of if you have some industry professionals or medical professionals specializing in cannabis that might, um, you know, be great to update and look at that to really differentiate that from the educational standpoint. 
And when we do speak of concentrates, Bryn had mentioned, you know, how it, um, you guys mentioned full spectrum concentrates in there. I'm hoping, and I think my understanding is correct, that there is a differentiation between full spectrum and distillate products on labeling, because if we do have concerns of either overconsumption or cannabis hyperemesis syndrome or anything like that, we really do, for from the education standpoint, need to um, very, you know, very specifically differentiate between a full spectrum product and a distillate product if we are moving towards hopefully getting rid of our um, concentrate cap. So that's something that I also think with the Department of Health and you guys could use, you know, a little bit of tweaking from the medical perspective. Um, and lastly, I just want to thank you guys for your advocacy on this concentrate cap. And as uh, James had mentioned, and I appreciate you mentioning it and want to remind people who are listening, you guys cannot make these changes. And most changes that have happened in Vermont have happened because people have stood up and reached out to their legislators and reached out to their reps and used their voices. So I think you guys have done a great job putting the info together. But everybody on this call and everybody in the cannabis community also needs to rally behind you and do their part and speak up as well individually and reach out again to legislators and reps because that is how we will make change because that's how we've made change here in Vermont thus far. So I think that's it. I tried to be quick and concise. Thank you guys for your time. Thanks, Jesse Lynn. Bernardo. Hi, sorry, uh, Bernie again. I just uh, I want to commend you guys on this report. I think it's really well written, kind of covers a lot of bases. Uh, my input would be uh, to not forget about California, Colorado, Maine, these states that don't have concentrate caps specifically. They have robust medical programs where patients have lots of access to different products and I think it would be a missed opportunity to not factor in sales of concentrate products from those markets, you know, comparing it to Vermont, where I think it's pretty well known people don't shop at the dispensaries here because of price and lack of availability of products. But in those other states, for example, Colorado Springs, when I lived there, it had a hundred different medical stores. Um, as a patient myself, I will say, when living in a state that had a robust medical program, my preference was to join that program because of the cost of concentrates and the taxes, making them kind of much less affordable on the adult use side. Um, so considering, you know, Maine, Colorado, these states that do have large, you know, uh, medical programs, a lot of people who consume cannabis opt to become patients in order to attain those concentrate products at a lower price. And so some of those adult use numbers might be skewed because they're missing a lot of users. Um, other than that, um, you know, I think just continuously hammering home the difference between solvent and distillation processes versus solvent less. You know, there is no distillation occurring during solvent less extraction. So ice water extracts, that's always a full spectrum product. When thinking about the nature of this THC cap, it kind of becomes clear to me that someone along the line thought liquid concentrates, distillate, that's why we're putting it in pens so that we can control it. Solid concentrates, not in pens. And, and I mean, I mean vape cartridges. And so, you know, going back to what you guys said and what Jessalyn Lynn spoke about, I think that consideration of a full spectrum single pass product versus a product that's refined several times in order to increase its THC potency, there needs to be some sort of distinction between those two types of products, not between, and not just lump them all together, I mean, so... Um, again, I really appreciate you guys and all the work that you put in. You're here for the people. I think everyone sees that. Um, you know, and so thank you very much. Thanks, Bernardo. <clears throat> Keith. Hi, 
Hi, this is Keith. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi. So I'm a, I'm a local hemp grower, just keeping an eye on ID or an, an eye on this market. But I noticed that you guys attended the, the USDA meeting they had over here a little while ago, last month. And they made a claim that if anybody uh, got licensed with you for growing in particular, that they would pull our USDA hemp licenses for next year. And so what concerns me is I, I see in the, the rule one rewrite that you have, the 2023 rewrite draft that you've got posted online, that you're pulling in uh, hemp derived products into the rule, which I believe is rule one, if they have more than one milligram of THC in any serving. Um, and I'm just wondering, are you aware of that conflict? It, you know, that one milligram is pretty easy to get there. Most, most of the uh, tinctures that are sold on the market now that are hemp derived uh, can hit that one milligram very quickly. And some of the flowers can as well. So I'm just, I'm looking at that thinking, how is this gonna work out? If you guys start pulling us under your purview for hemp and the USDA is telling us if we ever have to get a license with you, Keith. We did lose him. He's in the waiting room now. I'm readmitting him. Keith, I think you, uh, if you're back in yeah. the meeting, you dropped out. Are you I here am. now? I am good old Vermont internet infrastructure. <laughs> you dropped off right right where you were talking about the conflict between USDA requiring a hemp license and this one milligram issue. Right. So what I'm worried about is in this rewrite, it basically says if we have one milligram or more of any serving size of THC in them, that this rule applies. And so I, I don't know what it means yet, but what I've been told by the USDA is that if we have to get licensed with you guys, particularly for growing, uh, that they're going to pull our hemp license, which is a federal license under the farm bill. So it just feels like a freight train of uh, conflict coming. And I'm not looking to get overseen by any more regulatory agencies than I have to. So I'm just wondering if you if you are aware of that, number one, and is that the intent that if we had, for example, an oil that has exactly one milligram of THC in the end, are we going to have to follow the full rule and have to be licensed for all parts of that? Because if it does, it shuts us down at the federal level. Yeah. Yeah. Thank, thanks for that comment. And honestly, we're in the process of um, developing our hemp report. Um, the legislature gave us jurisdiction, shifted it from the Agency of Agriculture to the Cannabis Control Board starting January 1st of 2023. And um, we're going to have to develop rules and guidance. And clearly, this is an area where we're going to need to do, you know, one of these kind of Q and A sessions, networking events, um, and uh, we do have a report that's due, I think, in January fifteenth. That we're going to kind of lay out how we intend to regulate hemp derived products. We'll and review we'll that. We'll review we'll that probably later this year or, or very early next year. So, will there be a comment period on that before it comes absolutely. out in January? Yep, absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Yep. That was it. Yep. Thanks, Keith. Caleb. Hello, can you guys hear me there? Yeah. Cool. Um, I just want to say uh, some good recommendations in here, guys, um, especially I think as it pertains to the um, the THC caps and, and the vape tax as well. Um, that one's really killing the, the vape market out here. Um, $90 gram distillate carts are just not something that anybody I know is going to want to buy. So um, good stuff there. I'd also, I don't know if I, if you talked about the edible packaging at all, um, I feel like there was something in there. I was kind of being dragged in two directions, but that's another thing I think that could really help this market. I mean, again, $30 for 50 milligrams of, of cannabis edibles is really, really pushing it, you know, and I can go to my guy on the black market and get 500 milligrams for 10 bucks, you know, that's, you know, 10 times as much for a third of the price. So I I feel like some adjustment there would really help the edible market um, flourish a, a little bit here. Um, I do wanna also echo a couple of things that Jesse Lynn said, um, because I've also been hearing from people that uh, this seat on the advisory committee um, has been vacated and the symptom relief oversight committee has been um, disbanded or dissolved. And I, I agree with Jesse Lynn, if, 
if the advisory committee is meeting again, um, I understand a number of people worked pretty hard to lobby the legislature to get those seats added so that patients could have some representation at the table. And if Jim is no longer in that seat, I think it would be a great time to get somebody in that seat who is an actual patient who is not connected to one of these MSOs. Um, you know, I don't know who that would be, but it would be great to just have, you know, someone like Jesse Lynn, for example, I'm sure she's way too busy for that, but or Amelia or so, someone like that in that seat um, who, who really cares about this and knows this knows the legislation and, and cares about patients. I think um, someone like that would be great. Um, Jim also, um, during one of the advisory committee meetings last year, or the subcommittee meetings, he issued a report in the medical subcommittee meeting, I believe, um, which was submitted as some supplemental material that I have been trying to get a hold of and I have not been able to track down. And if you guys know where I could find that, that would be great. Um, and the last thing is uh, about the education piece. I really, um, again, I got to agree with Jesse Lynn here. Um, I feel like throwing money at the Department of Health is just kind of, um, you know, you might as well light it on fire with what I've seen from some of their executives in terms of their, what they consider education. You know, it's still very, very fear-based. A lot of it lacks scientific justification. Um, so, and even some of these rules, the, the THC caps and, and so forth, were something the Vermont Medical Society was sort of pushing without any justification, really. And honestly, I think you could get a better education from going to talk to industry professionals. I've learned more from talking to people in the last year than I have ever learned from any state agency in my entire life um, in terms of cannabis education. Those are the real people I think we should be talking to. And it would save millions of dollars. Um, Anyway, that's all I got, guys. Uh, thank you very much. If I could find that report, that would be really great. Thanks, Caleb. Keto. Hi, everybody. Um, so uh, I apologize. I had to step away from the meeting for business for a short time. But when I was listening, I didn't hear anything about the vape tax. And this definitely seems like the place that it should be. Um, and and this is it. If we don't get something changed in you know in this next session, um, a lot of retailers aren't going to want to sell these products for nothing or even at a loss because uh, the margins on the flower vapes are not great. And uh, but look, these are the, these are this is the healthiest way to to inhale cannabis. And and the fact is, Vermonters won't have a way, or at least it'll be a lot harder for them to get these products uh, if we don't get some change. Um, so that's all. Hopefully, everybody's having a great day. Thank you. Thanks, Tito. Bobby. Hello, uh, thanks for having me. Uh, I wanted to echo uh, some of these people uh, encouraging you to uh, push for ro more robust uh, reform efforts, uh, particularly partic oh, sorry, particularly in reforms to the edible packaging restrictions. Uh, especially with these $40 gummies, it's just really not fair to patients when, you know, we're talking all of $5 in ingredient cost and packaging, even uh, with these packaging restrictions. Um, it's really just going to push people to the traditional market. I can tell you that firsthand, uh, you know. Uh, I also would be remiss if I didn't take another moment to uh, lament the inconsistencies in communicating with y'all. Uh, time and time again in these meetings, you encourage people to reach out directly. Over the past six months, I've made dozens of emails and phone calls to central CCB contact points with all of one response. Uh, I do have a tentative meeting with one of you next week via phone, which I'm very thrilled about. But, uh, you know, that took a long time coming. Other than that, the only person we've been able to interact with is the individual processing our application, and that's been shaky at best. So I understand y'all are dealing with a lot, but I uh, wanted to encourage y'all to attempt to tweak some of these communication issues in the new year. Uh, thank you very much. Have a great day. Thanks, Bobby. Keith. Can you hear me? Hello. We can hear you, Keith. Thank you for taking your time today once again to uh, hold this meeting. I look forward to you changing your meeting platform to one, once a month because it'll be longer and more uh, informational. 
The comments say, are, are the CCB commissioners going out into the communities to develop equity in the cannabis industry? Is the CC building any educational cohorts for social equity participants? Development of informational videos. Uh, is there any effort to simplify the process, SEE process with in-depth overview of the benefits of being an SEP um, participant? Are you producing any awareness or equity in educational mission participants to work on some of these things? Are there any cohorts coming up to work with incubators to help people learn the technology that doesn't have the technology, such as using Dutchie or your new NCS analyticals um, track and trace system? Can you please post a overview for social equity applicants, a historical overview of cannabis and the racial disparities from the Marijuana Tax Acts of 1937 onto your website, please? That would be wonderful to have. Have. Um, also, what specific areas are the three of you as chair people specifically working on in your tenure during your time here at the CCB to increase the cannabis industry here in Vermont? What specific areas does James Pepper, Kyle Harris, and Julie Hubbard working on and Bryn Hare to increase this? I know you all work as a team, but do you have specific areas you want to work on individually to make them robust into thing. There also are two educators. I just whipped out two emails to you, all three just recently, if you could be, view those. I also want to know why, as a comment, why the CCB is not writing rule three for patients. I also do want to know why the CCB has not allowed Lindsay Wells to be a member of the chair board as the former director of the medical cannabis program, because there's no longer a director of medical Cannabis program, and she oversaw for 10 years, and she's not normally included on some of these meetings. It should be because there's a lot of patients on here today that don't have any representation. Um, she knows the thing. She could fill that advisory board seat. As the oversight committee, that has been disbanded. There's no longer an oversight committee in the state of Vermont overseeing the medical cannabis program at all. Currently, it has no um, leadership. It has two uh, um, administrators, but no leadership in, in the program at all. Is there any chance that you guys could list all, all the pro or possibly somebody here could pro list of all the pro senators and House of Representatives that are pro cannabis in the state of Vermont? And if anybody's willing to make a Vermont medical marijuana community website, that would be a better way for all of us to get together and enforce the state legislatures to hear us. And maybe we can get a committee to sit on the board at the state house. I'd be willing to do that as well. I have plenty of free time other than taking care of my child. There's things there that I'm looking forward to seeing like that. And other than that, um, you guys are doing pretty well right now. I know you need to add some more staff to your thing. Um, other states have about 50 to 200 people working in their staff. And I know you guys are a little shorthanded. So you're doing what you can and I get that. I appreciate it. And it takes time to reach back out. And I do thank you for reaching back out when you have. Thank you. Thanks, Keith. <clears throat> Chris. Chris. Hi, guys. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, all good. I just wanted to thank you guys for all your efforts that you guys are doing for uh, taking care of the THC caps. Um, I think it's... Uh, it's a long process. I know you guys have your hands tied with a lot of it, and I, I feel like you're, you've done an amazing job of putting that uh, research together for everyone. Um, one thing that I didn't see mentioned and I didn't feel like was represented well was the use of concentrates really allows people to not have to inhale all the smoke that's often used. I mean, it's, it's, it's a way of using cannabis without having to use much. And I believe that, you know, that for medical patients, it's really great to be able to not have to consume as much to get the same effect. And I think a lot of that, a lot of the fear that's around it all is that it's going to be abused on the level of, you know, overusing. But I think it really does give the, the patients and the users the ability to use less. And um, I think that that really wasn't represented in your in your findings there. And I um, I just wanted to put that out there. You know, the vape tax, 
um, taking away the ability for people to use different vaporization techniques, um, you know, such as a volcano, uh, having that be something that's just cost prohibitive in this state, um, you know, being able to dab, having um, proper temperature dabs, not just in a pen, but a really proper temperature dab is vaporizing those oils. And it's uh, it's much less harmful than other ways of consuming. I just th thought that that information should be brought to light. Thank you, I appreciate your work. Yeah, no, thank you, that's a good point. <clears throat> HMH. HMH, are you with us? Well, while we're waiting, <clears throat> If you join via the phone and would like to make a public comment, you can hit star six to unmute yourself. And uh, of course, if you join via the video link, um, just raise your virtual hand. We have no one who is joined via phone currently. And HMH is presumably not unmuted. No, they are still unmuted. That is correct. I'll just give it one. One more minute then. Hello, I think I got it. Yeah, yes. there you are. All right, great. Thank you guys. Sorry about that. I was calling to lobby the board on what cultivators are allowed to possess. Because these days with all of our big trimming machines, Keef is kind of a, an unavoidable byproduct after you're running flour through these machines that tumble them around and trim them. And so I'm wondering if there's some provision where the growers can sell our keef directly to the extractors or I'm just trying not to get stuck with a product here that I'm not allowed to have. And it seems like pouring it back into your trim batch or whatever is just really counterproductive and going backwards in my opinion, when you've got a big jar of nice separated keef and nothing to do with it. It presents some challenges. And other than that, I appreciate everything you guys have done and uh, having a great time with all this. Thank you so much. Great. Uh, thank you. Um, why don't you submit that question? I'm trying to think to our uh, compliance team. It's ccb.compliance at vermont.gov and they'll get you an answer on that specifically. I think it's on the what can I do with my license. Yeah. Or it's on the what can I do with my license. There's a one pager guidance on what can I do with my license also that I think has the answer to that question. Yeah. Okay. And I guess the other caveat to that is I'm having the same issues with sending you guys emails and never never ever getting a response. I understand you're busy and all that, but it's challenging on my end. Sorry about that. Well, um, if you can you do you mind sharing your name? Yeah, my name is Jennings. I'm with High Mountain Homegrown. I'm the tier okay. one outdoor. Great. Yep. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Dave is next. Hey guys. Um, uh, on Keefe, uh, just that was mentioned, it reminded me. Uh, I, I was surprised to see that that your your guidance doesn't allow cultivators uh, to to have the the Keefe. You know, it's just it literally falls off the plant, um, and, and it just kind of seems like a thing that it, if it's restricted to manufacturers, it just I think it's just going to get people in trouble for no reason at all, and and. And, and raise prices uh, ultimately because you know now you have to go through yet another hand in the supply chain. Um, you know there's not a huge market from what I'm seeing. Uh, there's not a huge demand for Keef at retail, um, but you know there's some. Um, and uh, you know the more you kind of artificially increase that price um, through well-intentioned but perhaps unnecessary 
uh, regulatory intervention, um, you know, the less um, that, that that demand is going to be met in in stores, uh, and the more it'll be met on the you know quote unquote street. Um, so I think that's one that uh, you know I would urge you guys to reconsider. Um, anyway, thanks. Have a great day. Thanks, Dave. Anyone else for a uh, public comment? Okay, I'll um, close the public comment window. Um, always, you know, feel free to get reach out to us in between meetings. Um, and thanks for joining today. And we'll see you all next week. Adjourn the meeting. <laughs>